the thing is not how you are on your best day is how can you step up on your worst day? What's your, when everything is going terrible, when you're tired, when you're frustrated, when you are edgy, how do you treat other people? Everyone you meet every single day is fighting a battle you may know nothing about. We're all in the process of overcoming. I'm Justin Wren, and my story has been heard by millions of people through my book, my TED Talk, podcast interviews, TV shows, professional fighting, and my foundation, Fight for the Forgotten. I believe we are all overcomers if we choose to overcome. We all have the option. I've been given the opportunity to overcome childhood trauma, sexual abuse, immense bullying, depression, suicidal ideation, substance use disorder, and I am a two-time suicide survivor. We are here to have conversations with some of the greatest minds of our time. Get ready to be inspired and to receive the tools and game plan to win this fight called life. Thank you for being here, for showing up for yourself. You, me, we have overcome 100% of our darkest days. I'm not done yet, and neither are you. This is your invitation to overcome. Here we go. Get ready. Buckle up, Buttercups. We've got an overcome giveaway. When you review the show on Apple Podcast, you're going to be entered to win one of four $25 gift cards. How cool is that? Each week, we are going to give away to four lucky winners, two $25 Amazon gift cards, and two lucky winners are going to get $25 gift cards to Onnit, the sponsor of this show. We so appreciate it when you share it with a friend. And please rate, review, and subscribe to the show because the idea is to grow this into the most meaningful podcast in the world. We want you to win too. We want to hear your feedback. We want to know how we can grow the show, what you like to hear. We're so grateful for you. And I hope that you're one of the ones to win. Just leave a review on Apple podcast. Welcome back to overcome with Justin Wren. And today's guest is incredible. And you're going to love his accent. It's Daniele Bolelli. He is an author, a philosopher, a university professor, a single father, a podcaster, a true martial artist at heart. He is the host of the incredible podcast, two of them, The Drunken Taoist and History on Fire. In this episode, Daniele breaks down life principles, lessons from martial arts, and knowledge in simple form to help us overcome whatever is holding us back. He's an author of four books, Not Afraid, 50 Things You Are Not Supposed to Know About Religion, Create Your Own Religion, and On the Warrior's Path. Get ready to overcome hopelessness with a defiant smile and a raised middle finger. This man was incredible. I'm so grateful for his time. He's been a numerous time guest, seven, eight times on Joe Rogan's podcast. I think he's the only man to ever have his daughter climb up into his lap during the podcast. He's been on Duncan Trussell's, on Aubrey Marcus's. And he's just an incredible man. You're going to love, love, love this episode. So let's get right into it. All right, here we go. Thank you so much for being here on Overcome with Justin Wren. And this is a powerhouse episode already just because the man that you are. I'm really grateful. I know you would, you're, you're a martial artist. You have the heart of a humble man. And, uh, you know, this has been a practice for a lot of your life. But I just am blown away by who you are. I mean, the, the books that you've written. Um, the podcast that you have, the podcast that you've been on with uh, Rogan seven or eight or more times and Duncan Trussell. I listened to one of those today, Fearless. And I just got your book yesterday. I haven't been able to get into it too much, but I've got Not Afraid here. It's on fear, heartbreak, raising a baby girl and cage fighting. And that's a really unique combination that I think draws people in. (laughs) Yeah. I'm glad that you feel that way about my stuff because usually it's just me in front of the mirror flexing, telling myself, you are so good. You are so (laughs) well. It's always nice when it's not yourself. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I mean, do you really do that flex and tell yourself you're so nice? Uh, I mean, uh, because uh, that can be a good practice. uh, No, I mean, I'm like, I'm a 14 year old at heart. I never grew up. So I'm like, uh, I realized like, I, once I made a post about it, because I realized, you know, a bunch of people would follow me on Facebook or Instagram. They're probably looking for, oh, maybe there's some deep philosophical thing or there's some cool history at least. And they get like 48 year old me, my 14 year old mind suddenly just flex it and do it. And <laughs> I'm just like, that's part of the deal. Yeah. Well, I, 
I like that. Amy's been encouraging me, my partner who you just met, she's been encouraging me to, you know, stand in front of the mirror and tell myself that I love me sometimes and that, um, and to have that as a practice because self love has been one of my biggest challenges in life. And there's a great yeah. book out called, uh, love yourself like your life depends on it. And I think that yeah. we oftentimes will love others, uh, quicker, faster, love them harder yeah. than we love ourselves. And this journey for you, not afraid the book came out, I think in 2015, uh, or 2016, but it, I mean, just the opening pages. I mean, is it okay if I read an endorsement or two just to, yeah, I mean, Duncan Trussell said, Bolelli is a genius warrior philosopher. What he talks about here is the opposite of a victim's mentality. That's powerful, by the way. By sharing the emotional apocalyptic experiences he has gone through, he gives a gift to anyone who is struggling with the dragon of fear and sadness. Everyone, please listen. Open your ears and open your hearts to the incredible, the brilliant, the super sweet Daniele Bolelli. And uh, other guys that endorsed it are Aubrey Marcus. Uh, a friend of ours and you just have, you've surrounded yourself with, with really great people, but this book seems like it's divided into three different parts and yep. it's a, a, all based on fear. Could you explain a little bit of that? Yeah, I broke it up. Is, um, this is the closest to an autobiographical thing that I've done. You know, normally I've written things that are more philosophical in nature. This is more kind of through lived experience. So there are still the same ideas that I like to play with, but they are more applied to life. And uh, the first section is about sort of my experiences in martial arts, dealing with fear and things like that. Section two is about uh, kind of my relationship with my wife and eventually the death of my wife. Mm. And section three is the afterwards is, uh, you know, when my wife died, uh, my, my daughter was about a year and a half old. So clearly, that's a bit of a challenge in the sense that suddenly you are dealing with grief, you're dealing with your world uh, falling to pieces. And at the same time, you can't really afford to let yourself be swept in all that because you got a little baby who needs you and you need to step up whether you feel like it or not. And, uh, and so that's kind of how those three sections. The themes are related, but of course the, the setting is different. Right. And I, I really appreciate that, that you would be so open and vulnerable about your story. I mean, mm -hmm. I heard on Duncan Trussell's, you were saying that on that podcast, you were sharing how, you know, you didn't think really uh, it was appropriate to write a story about yourself or that you were uh, just sure. thinking about, you know, I, I write these kind of books and this one, people are asking me to write mine. And in the intro or preface to this book, Not Afraid, you wrote about how people would dig or, or, or get inspiration about a lot of this, the stories you would share about history and things that you've learned, but that it really impacted or gripped people's hearts whenever you shared your own personal experience. And I've seen that in my story and sharing the story of the people that we help through the nonprofit I started. But I, I would love to maybe wade into the waters of what you've written here. Um, because I think a lot of people deal with grief and a, a lot of times in our culture, at least in America, we don't, I think it's interesting that sometimes we, I I've experienced death overseas and in Africa and I, I've dug a couple of graves for some children that I, I absolutely loved. And that was just really hard. It was so in your face. It was so real. And you yeah. didn't have time to prepare yourself in a suit and get flowers and everyone composed themselves. and. The way that they grieved, I actually honor and respect and admire because they allow themselves to feel it. Uh -huh. They face it all. They feel it all. And from that, I think sometimes magic can happen where you, you, you come closer, you deal with it more, you don't hide it, you don't stuff it down. And so what was it that you've learned from martial arts or what was it that you learned from? We'll, we'll get into it all, but where would you like to go from there? Like, I think one of the... One of the things that to me has been most valuable in martial arts has been the experience of getting one's ass kicked okay. over and over again. And like, because, you know, everybody loves martial arts when things are going great and you pull off the perfect armbar or you're doing this amazing, you know, of course, you feel wonderful about yourself. You feel you are amazing. The, but the reality is that most of the time it's not like that. Like even the best fighter in the world is always going to run into somebody who's better than them on that one particular day and who's going to kick their ass. So defeat yeah. 
is an inevitable part of the journey. And mm. of course, it's an inevitable part of life in the sense that you're going to get your ass kicked by life over and over and over and over again. So learning how to deal with, because, you know, the natural reaction is, I don't want to be here. This sucks. I want to get out of here. This does not feel good. And sometimes to be on the mat or in the ring and staying in a match where you know you're not going to win it. And whether it's an actual match or it's just a particularly grueling practice session where mm. you know you're not going to win it, there's pretty much nothing you can do that's going to turn the tables around and make it because this person is better than you, faster, stronger, younger, whatever that may be, right? And yet to stay in it, to be able to acknowledge that, no, I don't fully control the outcome. Because I think that's one of the illusion of martial arts training that we get is that we, we gravitate toward it because it offers a sense of empowerment, which is true to some degree. But then there's also a reality that sometimes there are things you cannot change, mm. that there's no way that you suddenly go and be the best fighter in the world, or there's no way that you can prevent people you love from dying, and there's no way from a lot of things. And so learning how to stay with it when you're getting your ass kicked, not letting it crash you, not letting it make you try to run away from it all because you have to be present to what's going on is, uh, to me, is probably more important than uh, anything else I can ever pick up from martial arts. Yeah, I love that. It's so true. I mean, you even remind me in, in the book, you talk about Michael Jordan. It seems like you like basketball as well. Mm -hmm. And sure. you share the story of how uh, on game five in, um, the world championship game, you know, he was, he was sick. He had a fever and every doctor told him he wasn't going to be able to go in there and do it. And that, uh, will to power and yeah. being able to say, I'm going to go in there and score 38 points and make the game winning shot. Um, you know, he had to overcome that adversity of physical illness, a fighter that you're reminding me of just because your accent sounds similar to him as George St. Pierre, right? <laughs> and, uh, and when Matt Sarah beat him, nobody yeah. gave him a shot because he was going against who many believed was the greatest of all times. Yeah. And yet he went in there and was able to overcome. And uh, then George was able to rally back in, in the rematch. And so that constant struggle of who's going to show up that night or show up every day consistently, even when it hurts, even when it's tough, even when you're afraid. I think you had an interesting perspective in the book where you said that something similar to the fact that maybe when people first see you, they don't think that you are a fighter um, and that you are, you know, uh, a, a scholar of sorts and, and, and professor, but you've been able to blend these and mesh them all together. What drew you into martial arts and overcoming that fear of someone throwing punches at you and trying to take off your head? I think it's precisely because I've always been a little bit on the nerdy side. I've, I've grown up in a household where you spend a lot of time reading and writing and talking about ideas and this, that, and the other. And, you know, I know I could do that well. But to me, it's like, okay, that's one language. That's one energy. That's one way to relate to people. There are many others. Mm -hmm. And so if this is all kind of up in your head and wordy and very more intellectual so to speak to me is like okay what do i need i need the exact opposite i need something mm. where nobody gives a shit what you think or how flowery your speech is is either you can perform or you cannot something physical something where it's very objective there's no room for debate it's not about well let me spin that in a good way no you either perform well or you don't there's nothing else Right. And I really like that. I really like that sense of uh, something much more pragmatic and hands-on. And not that in alternative, you know, it's like they're complementary. Like yeah. they both are great in their own ways. And I think oh, if you are the person who's more physically driven, you need to probably read poetry and right. be a little more nerdy. You know, it's like it's, it's just a way to become a bigger... By bigger, I don't mean better necessarily, like more of a person. I right. mean like... You have more tools in your belt. You have mm. more ways to relate to people. Some people are not going to respond to one kind of language because that's not their experience and that's all they know. But if you can, if you can tweak it and you have something else in your own experience, then you can bring it to their level in a way that makes sense to them. Yeah, I, I love that. Being able to translate that even 
even the head knowledge into the knowledge on the mats. And there's so much philosophy on the mats. The mats has been, to me, it's been the ultimate equalizer. It doesn't matter what color, race, creed, uh, religion, or, you know, social status, what you, you're all equal on the mats. And it's, it's really cool. It becomes like a brotherhood or a tribe. And, uh, there's so many great female martial artists and, and on the mats, you can just learn from each other and you can apply those things to life. Whenever you're able to take that kind of adversity, become comfortable being uncomfortable, being put in worst case scenario. And the first time you're put in worst case scenario, you're likely to give up, uh, or, or, or just get finished or get outclassed, outskilled. Um, but the more you put yourself in that position, the more you're able to handle it learn to look for the escape, the reversal, even a submission. And being able to take that into life has been something really great. And being, I think martial artists are lifelong students. And yeah. for you, you're, you're both, right? You're a teacher, uh, but a professor, but you're also a student of martial arts and a student of life. What do you think martial arts has taught you the most of that um, you can apply to life or that you can even share from martial arts to your students in the classroom? I really think in that sense, I mean, there are many, many things, right? Yeah. There are many aspects of martial art that I love that have given me insight in aspects of life and everything. But uh, in some way, what you are hinting at, this idea of being able to step up when you don't feel, because everybody, I mean, not everybody, but most people can step up when everything is going well. Mm. Most people, if you catch them on their best day, they're pretty good. You know, there's the occasional complete cycle who doesn't have best days, but for the most part, you know, somebody on their best day, they can embody some great qualities. They can have a good, the thing is not how you are on your best days. How can you step up on your worst day? What's your, when everything is going terrible, when you're tired, when you're frustrated, when you are edgy, how do you treat other people? How do you, you know, and, and I think in that sense, for me, having a, a little girl was really mm. huge because you were such a mirror. You know, with other people, with adult relationships, you can always say, ah, you know, I was kind of a dick, but it was their fault because they did this and this. Uh, with a kid, it's not their fault. You know what I mean? They are a kid. They are like, so everything is about you. <laughs> like how you are reacting is just about you. It's not about they did anything wrong. You know, a kid who spilled milk on the floor is not, it's a kid. It's just what they do. Right. Right. But if you freak out about it, that's just on you. Mm. And so having that mirror put to my face, I saw things I really didn't like, you know, I saw moments when I'm nervous and stressed and I haven't slept in too long. And so suddenly I'm all angry and mad and I'm lashing out and I'm like, you're a piece of crap, man. It's like, seriously, you're going to lash out at some little kid who need you to be decent and good because you can't handle your own emotions. I think we can do better than that. You know, I think yeah. that's just not okay. There's no way to, because I think otherwise, you know, we tell ourselves stories, we find excuses, we find the reasons why we reacted in a certain way in some circumstances where I could not find any possible excuse. I mean, yeah, I can find excuses, but they are, they are just that. They are an explanation for why I'm an, an edgy. But at the end of the day, I'm the one who chooses to react in a crappy way right. and pass it on to somebody who doesn't deserve it. You know? Yeah. I, I heard a quote recently or someone shared at this meeting I was at saying that basically the people in our lives are put there by the universe as like cosmic mirrors to, mm -hmm. to allow us to see ourselves and how we're behaving. And that's, that's exactly what you're saying with your little girl. One of the things I loved most seeing about you was I think you might be the only guest in Joe Rogan's history that had his little girl climb up into his lap during an episode. And she was so adorable, so cute. And I just saw a beautiful heart of a a good man and a good father and you were able to do your thing still. And it was just, uh, it was, it was beautiful. I really loved seeing the love you had for her. And I think that's powerful. Um, you have kids in your life. Oh yeah. I have kids in my life. Amy's Amy put a note over to me and I was trying to read it, but I have kids in my life now and it's Amy's girls. They're 12, they're 16 years old. And I can totally relate to them being placed in my life as a mirror because, you know, 12 and 16 year old girls, like it's been great 
but I, I'm not a father yet and I'm not a father and don't actually plan on having children, but I get to be a father figure or a, a good man in their life. Right. And yeah. that's been something I've stepped into. And what, what would you have as advice as, as a father now to someone that's stepping into that stage at 12 and 16 years old? And it's the first time they've ever had some sort of parental role or at least impact. I think a huge thing. Uh, I mean, I've applied it from the get go, but I don't think it's uh, there's ever a moment where it's too late to apply this idea is. I never cracked down the whip and made it like, I'm the authority figure, you need to listen to me because I'm the authority figure. It was more like, look, we have the same goals here because mm. you want to be happy and you want to be healthy. And that those are my priorities. I want you to be happy and I want you to be healthy. So we are in 100% agreements regarding the goals. Yeah. If we ever have a disagreement, is about strategy. And strategy is bullshit. Because strategy is, you know, we can negotiate, we can figure it out. You know, if I think an approach is the best one, but you can show me that what I don't think is such a good approach work, I'll drop mine. Who cares? It's, I'm not attached to my strategy. I'm attached to you being healthy and happy. Right. So in that sense, suddenly you are partners in crime. You know, you are <laughs> accomplices trying to get this goal down together right. rather than me trying to impose my way on you, which of course it means that the second you turn your back, they are going to have a rebel and do whatever. Because naturally, that's what we all do, right? right. Nobody likes to be bossed around. So setting it up as, look, I'm going to treat you with respect and I'm going to trust you. Uh, in exchange, consider that sometime I may have something to say that may not be a bad idea, even if it doesn't resonate with you right away. Let, let's toy with that concept. Because again, the goal is the same. Nobody's trying to limit your freedom just for the sake of limiting your freedom or trying to make you... Let's just think about the pros and cons of certain choices together. And uh, maybe we can make them work. Maybe we can't. Let's figure it out. But again, it's a process of working through it together. And I think that builds trust because right. suddenly if I have an opinion, you don't have to listen because I'm telling you to listen. You listen because you see that I've tried 10,000 times to do what's best for you. Mm. And then you are like, huh, let me consider that. Let me see. Because at the end of the day, they are going to do what they want anyway. You know, doesn't even, that's why the whole crack the whip model just simply doesn't, not only is unpleasant, but also it doesn't work. Right. Because people will rebel, of course. Um, but if there's nothing to rebel against, because you're just an ally there, you're there to help them to offer guidance and support, but you're not there to squash their choices. It's a big difference. Right. That's great. I love that advice. Thank you for that. Being their ally. Yeah. That's a, that's a good strategy just to, to say, Hey, I, I'm your friend, but also I want you healthy, healthy and happy. I mean, that, that yeah. point really drives it home because that is the goal. That is the yep. goal for anyone that you love. You want them to be healthy and you want them to be happy. And so, and, oh, go ahead. No, and in that sense, tapping my experience for my girl or anybody, like the, the person who's older, who is in the parental figure is like, by all means, tapping my experience, however, is useful. There are going to be limitations because sometimes I think that because it applied to me, it applies to you too, and it may not at all. But, you know, let's use the fact that I do have more experience to for the good without making it be a limitation for you, you know, yeah. just as a resource. On it.com slash overcome. You know, those times when you're so into what you're doing that you can't think about anything else. The days when you finish your work without looking up once. How do you like to feel that kind of focus every single day? Whether I'm training for or in an MMA fight or if I'm engaged in a new philanthropy project. We're sitting down in front of an epic podcast host or guest. I want to get into that flow state faster and stay engaged longer. With AlphaBrain, you can. It's clinically studied nootropic ingredients support memory, mental speed, and flow state. That feeling of being in the zone. So you can be focused and productive anytime. It's a world-renowned nootropic supplement with more than 1 million bottles sold. Why? Because it works. I know it works. I want you to, too. With its trademarked ingredient blends, Alpha Brain helps build an environment in which your brain can operate on all cylinders, promoting lasting mental clarity. It also helps your vision too. You can save up to 30% when you try Alpha Brain today. Give yourself the gift of a healthier, higher functioning brain. That's a no brainer. Try Alpha Brain today on it.com slash overcome.
I think I could switch gears a little bit, but it's still in the parental role you had as a single father. I saw a post that you made on Instagram. I think it might've been years back, but you were talking about being a single father and how Mm -hmm. you would hear the comment a lot that you were a hero and that people would be praising you and loving on you. And you were saying something to the effect that, you know, for these single mothers, like it's just expected of them and uh, there's no real praise given. And, and I thought that that was a really cool perspective, but how, how can you share a little bit of that experience of, you know, I think you were just trying to do the next right thing. Yeah, I think that's, uh, I mean, that's just sort of unfair gender standards that, you know, I granted I was going through hell and bending Mm -hmm. over backwards and trying to do the good stuff. But I was getting a lot of like, oh my God, that is so amazing. And I'm like, I'm just a parent trying to do what's best for their kid. When suddenly if the parent is the mother is like, well, of course, that's what you're supposed to do. And it's like, I mean, that's what every parent is supposed to do. But at the same time, doesn't mean that some somebody's a woman, it's any easier uh, for them. You know, it's still, they still don't get to sleep at night as much as they would want to. They still are stressed for time. They still are, there's all this pressure. So yeah, I found that kind of, I mean, it was both working to my benefit because people were very supportive, but at the same time, I'm like, that same support could be extended to a lady who's in the same situation, you know, it's not right. any different. Yeah. I thought that was an eye-opening perspective that you shared, and I really appreciated that. The to 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 lean into your relationship with your wife, I saw you honoring her, and I would love to honor her story on and y'all's love story on this podcast because you shared how when you met her, she embodied such feminine beauty. But don't don't be mistaken; she also could take down a mountain lion, and that. Uh, I mean, I just was like, wow, you know, you saw how strong she was, how fierce she was, how beautiful she was and how y'all met through, I, I believe it was through martial arts. Yeah. yeah. And so maybe you could share some of that story and what you've learned through y'all's, y'all's entirety of your relationship. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that attracted me a lot to her was her intensity. She just, you know, she walk into the room and you feel this energy that's almost overpowering in the room. They're just these, uh, and it was interesting because she clearly had two sides to her. You know, one level, everybody from babies to animals to adults, everybody would gravitate toward her because when she, when she hit her good stride, she was like a sun, right? So full of energy and passion and love and warmth and amazing, right? So everybody gravitate toward it. But then there's also the way she grew up, which was horrendously abusive mm. and harsh and terrible and an environment that really doesn't make you trust people or feel very good about humanity and so that same intensity would switch into this just pitiless angry edgy like i'm gonna kill you all and you just go like whoa that is scary and intimidating in multiple ways and, you know, part of the whole deal is that it was clear from the start that, you know, it wasn't going to be an easy relationship by any stretch of the imagination. I had the uh, thought, desire, hope that, you know, if you just pour enough love into it, uh, the, the harsher part will diminish and the other part that you, what's her true nature will just become the dominant one all the time. And it didn't quite work like that in the sense that I think uh, the relationship with me helped her having um, moments of happiness that she probably wouldn't have had otherwise, but it didn't really kind of hit that switch where suddenly she could turn and really be that person that her nature was supposed to be. Like she, that environment, she just couldn't leave it behind. That anger, like she, I remember her telling me at some point, like when she said, you know, anger is the emotion I'm most comfortable with. And I was like, oh, Jesus, that's a little intense. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, I got my own share of anger issues, but like amateur hour compared to her, you know? Yeah. And, um, and so that was, um, that also was a bit of a mirror of showing me my limitations. It's like, you can have the best intention. You can bend over backwards. You can love somebody to death. 
but you cannot just change somebody through sheer willpower. You know, there, there are some factors that are outside of my control. Were they outside of her control? I don't know. Maybe she could have done more or done something else that helped her turn the corner. But um, it just wasn't there. Oddly enough, I saw it kind of at the end, at the very end, like the last month or so, when it was clear that things was going, that things were going really bad, I swear just having much more gratitude mm. than I've ever seen her have. I've seen her appreciate people in her life much more than she ever had. So there was a moment there where I was like, whoa, where did that come from? You know, and, um, and that was beautiful to watch. Right. Yeah. I think, I think for me, I grew up getting very heavily bullied and mm -hmm. that was, that was some of the toughest stuff that I've ever gone through in my life from eight years old to 13 years old, really b brutally b bullied. And then when I found martial arts, that was my outlet. When I yep. saw the UFC, I was like, these guys don't get bullied. And then I fell in love with the chess match, the art okay. of, of the sport. But I think sometimes I've, I've evolved this way of thinking, but uh, you see guys backstage and sometimes Sometimes they're nervous and they're throwing up before they go out there. Uh, that's more on the rare side. Sometimes they're just completely at peace at Zen meditating in the back. Sometimes their coaches are slapping them and, and they're getting ready. Like each guy kind of has their own ritual before they go in there and fight. But I think a lot in wrestling, I had a chip on my shoulder, this fierceness, this anger that I would let a resentment that would just fuel. Like I have to prove myself. And I've started to chip away at that a lot lately um, in the last few years, but it's been quite the process. Um, and so I've, I've had to be patient in becoming someone who I haven't been. And, uh, and it's been, it's uh, like you, I've been applying a lot of the martial arts principles to my life and seeing that better my life for you. If you could set it up for the listeners, how was it that, you guys that you lost your, your beautiful bride and, and what sure. was that like in the grieving process? If that's okay to go there. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So what happened was uh, we had our daughter in uh, summer of 2009 and then uh, for, you know, she definitely, yeah, my wife struggled for sure like, because he was even of course more in like she was fantastic with my daughter like she was she could be harsh with pretty much anyone in the world at, at any given time but with with her daughter she was always awesome she put all her anger aside with her that was like existed for everybody else but not for her daughter so that was phenomenal to watch went for about a year or so and with almost eerie and creepy coincidence pretty much within days of when she started breastfeeding after about a year or so she started developing some symptoms and initially they were like eh, minor shit you know it's like oh your shoulder is always hurting it's like eh, you know maybe you picked her up wrong or you've been holding weird positions or whatever and then very quickly, symptoms started getting worse. Now it's her leg is acting weird too. Now, and then we realized, okay, this is something neurological. It's not a muscle and tissue kind of thing. Initially, they diagnosed her with uh, multiple sclerosis. Mm. And they thought that's what it was. But the symptoms were going, like, getting worse daily. Like, she went from being very athletic, very strong, to within... Um, I think that started probably beginning of September. By November, she was like having a hard time walking. She was, uh, you know, all of that. I think by late November, I was pretty much carrying her up the stairs and so on. So it was a dramatic descent. And I was like, Jesus, I read about multiple sclerosis. It doesn't look, I mean, there are some people who struggle, but not this quick. Not like maybe if it's a particular attack, but this is lasting a long time. So long story short, they eventually figured out that things kept getting worse and worse real quick. They eventually figured out that she had a really aggressive brain tumor, pretty much inoperable because it was in a part mm -hmm. of the brain that you could not really touch. Very aggressive, very quick, all of that, right? So she decided she didn't want to do chemo or anything. She was like, you know what? If the goal here is to prolong us with some crappy quality of life for a year or two or three, and in the process, my daughter acquires even more awareness of what's going on and just see her mom fade away and die, 
no thanks. I mm. think I'll check out now and be done with it. So she just decided to go on hospice care. And then, uh, you know, after a while, they essentially start loading you up with morphine and uh, that kind of, I mean, you're already going there, but that clearly speeds things up. And um, that's for, sort of the process. Yeah. And for you, being, you know, her husband and mm-hmm. also like that was her wishes, but was that a hard thing to come to at first, like not doing treatment? And then for you being a fighter, I mean, it, now, now looking back, that makes the most sense. But in the moment for you, was it, th- there's resources, there's, there's help, there's care, there's, or was there any battle there internally for you or? Yeah. Those are the things that are weird almost because you wonder, like, is there some sense of premonition or something? Because I remember she telling me, having this conversation with me on an absolutely regular basis for years and years, where she would all of a sudden say, if I'm ever in a situation where I don't really have a hope to get good quality of life again, I want to be out. I don't want Mm -hmm. to, you know, so... and, you know, she was saying it in a situation if she wasn't able to make her own choices, which it was in this scenario. Uh, but she was kind of like, if I'm in that, it's like, do not resuscitate. Let me go. This is it. And I was like, you know, sometimes she would bring it up like you're having dinner pleasantly. And he's like, Jesus, where did that come from? You know, hmm. it's like, sure. OK, fine. You know, I'll, I get it. Those are your wishes. I'll, uh, but um so in that sense, it was very much like that wasn't even up for discussion because I knew where our priorities were. I knew I've known it for years that that's kind of her mentality, that she either wanted to have a certain kind of lifestyle or she didn't. There was no in between. Yeah, that makes so sense. In that sense. You know, initially, I think, of course, the oddly enough, the worst part was when there was hope. You know, mm. when I was hoping that she could get better and I would kept seeing her slide worse and worse and worse each day, but we're bending over back or trying to figure out ways to heal her, help her, do this and that. It was atrocious. Mm. When uh, when we realized that game is up, there's at most you can delay the inevitable, but it's there's no, there really was no realistic hope at that point. It's horrible. But at the same time, it was almost, uh, there was an element, you know, when you give up hope, you also lose a lot of fear mm. because what's left to be afraid of, the worst is already happening. He's like, what's next? Is like something worse than this. It's like, no, this is as bad as it gets, you know? So in a way, it forced me for a while, like, and from the time we knew to when she died, it wasn't really very long. It was probably like little over a month or something. Wow. And, um, it forced me to step up in a different kind of way because uh, we know where it's going. We know there's no hope. We know she's not going to get better, but she's not dead. She's still around. So for the time being, there's still stuff that needs to be done for her. There's still a more than practical stuff emotionally. She needs to smile. She needs to laugh. Yeah. She needs to have good moments. In, and, you know, how do you find good moments and stuff to laugh about where you have absolutely no hope for the future? That was that tricky thing of like completely being in the moment, you know, mm. where you're laughing for right now. Yeah. Not, you know, the past is gone, future there is none. You're mm. going to die and that's it. So it's like, but we still have this moment and the next and the next and trying to make those pleasant. That w- that shifted my focus and it was from, oh, let's find a cure. And then when you realize, okay, that isn't, then it's like, okay, how do I make you, how do I make whatever time you have as, as good as possible? Right. Do you remember any of those? That's an incredible perspective and eye opening for people who haven't gone through mm-hmm. something similar to your journey. So you're you're helping me, you're helping others that are hearing this. And what would be one of those memories, if you have one, that is being in the present and finding joy, even though, in your words, like there was no hope, like this was sure. the, the, there is an inevitable doom that's coming. So yeah. in the moment, how, how was a way that you played that support role and just a way to smile or a way to laugh? A lot of it is uh, the same thing that make you laugh in regular life when you're not like you just crack, like you forget the context and there there's that one thing that's funny right now or that you can crack a joke about and you just laugh about it without even. So there were, you know, the little whatever it was, the stuff that would make her laugh before 
we would still find ways to bring it up and laugh about it now. Or or sometimes straight up, I mean, I used a lot of gallows humor because, you know, you're not denying the situation. You're not pretending that it's not there. But like sometimes you you say things that are sound horrendously inappropriate, but in the context, they are kind of funny, you know? I mean, yeah. even after he went, like even for my own mental health, I remember once when, uh, you know, yeah, imagine like pleasant situations, right? You're going to get the cremation done. And so you have to talk to the guy who's going to burn her body and, and pay him. And, you know, and clearly these guys in this atmosphere, they deal with a lot of people who are in a terrible mental space because they have gone through hell. So they're all somber and stuff. And I remember this guy was like, eventually has to give me the bill. And I forgot what it was like, I don't know, $2,000 or whatever it is, right? And so I just uh, reach in my pocket and start putting a quarter on the table. And then I put a dime and then I put <laughs> another dime. But then, and I did it for like 20 seconds where I'm just standing coins. And the guy's looking at me, he's like, is he trying to give me $2,000 in coins? <laughs> And then I was yeah. just like, ah, oh, just fucking with you. And then, yeah. and then he cracked up and he was like, man, I don't get to laugh much in my job. You know, yeah. it's like, it's, uh, that's, and, that's good. You know, you need to, you know, you need to, cause otherwise the heaviness of it mm. all is going to destroy you. Yeah. So you need to find ways to laugh in the, even in situations that are completely hopeless. Yeah. And in, in martial arts, we have a unique opportunity to, train with people that might be, uh, veterans or, or military and maybe police officers or, or even paramedics and, uh, people that on their job, they see some brutal things. And sometimes the people that I've seen go through probably the most trauma on the job, they've had some of the most, uh, funny, but also sometimes inappropriate humor that, that, that I think, you know, they can bring joy into those situations that are really hard for whoever's going through it, whether it's themselves or somebody else. And that's a real gift that you get to give somebody. And you've got to really read the room. Because if you make an inappropriate (laughs) joke that is not well received, you really screw things up. You know what I mean? So you really need to, if you're going to go there, you need to expect that the other person is going to appreciate it and you have a sense of it. You cannot just shoot in the dark because you can make a bad situation worse otherwise. Yeah. And you said, you said shoot in the dark. It reminded me of something because you said when there is no hope, but I was also thinking of how do you find hope in in your experience, your lived experience? How do you find hope in the dark? I mean, in your wife's situation, you know, there was no hope, but then in other times, I think some people are so quick to give up, give up on something because they're walking through some darkness, but in a fight, whenever you're backs against a cage or in the corner and the barrage of punches are coming at you, you can either, you know, sit down cave and let a guy TKO you or or knock you flush out or choke you out. Or you can look for that little bit of hope in the dark and find a way out. um, Like if you think about like in history, one of the things that everybody who fought the Roman empire ever said, and by the way, I'm going to be using the Roman empire as a positive. Yeah. Keep in mind the Romans are, fucking psychos you know they were just like their culture was ultra violent and they had serious issues so i'm not putting them up as a model of mental health or anything else but in terms of sheer toughness the thing that everybody said was these little bastards just don't give up Mm. you know what i mean because everybody loses battles and usually what happens is that if you lose enough battles you give up and so you don't crash completely the enemy you crash them 20, 30, 40% of the way until they say, okay, I've had, an, I've had enough. The thing that made the Roman Empire pretty much impossible to beat wasn't that you couldn't beat them, is that you would crash their army and they send another. So you crash that one and they send another. And they, and they were willing to pay a price that nobody else was willing to pay. And they, and then kind of becomes a superpower because mm. it's just these like you can't beat them once or twice or three times. You have to crash as long as there's any life left, they are gonna keep coming at you. That's a really intimidating thing to deal with. Because it's like, hey, I thought we are reasonable people that if I pummel you enough, you will give up. But it's like when there's that completely berserker, no, unless I'm in the grave, I'm not giving up. It's scary. It's scary. I mean, I'm sure you deal like when you, that's one of the things that among fighters, wrestlers in particular tend to have that mentality 
where you know you will roll with some good jujitsu guys, and if you catch somebody, they usually tap. Right. Wrestlers, anything short of being one millimeter away from ripping their limbs or choking them unconscious, they don't. You know, you have right. somebody who's turning purple, it's in this perfect choke, and they are still going, and you're like, what do I need to do? You know, yeah. it's like and it's it's a little scary. Yeah, I had I so I was a a, a wrestler, uh like a 10 time state champion in Texas, but like a two time national champion. And I lived at the Olympic training center. And and for me, when I came over into jujitsu, uh, I was surprised that sometimes even upper belts, not, not necessarily upper belts, but, but guys that weren't white belts, I could potentially make tap just by pressure, uh, sure. blue belt, uh, purple belt. And as long as I had, I was just constant pressure from the wrestling world. And then they couldn't understand that sometimes they could have me in a deep choke, a uh, upper belt, like brown, brown, brown belt, black belt. And I wasn't tapping unless they were putting me out and they're like, Hey, when I get you this deep, you yeah. probably should tap because like, you right. don't need a sore neck for the next no. week. Yeah. And I was like, nah, man, you didn't get me. And so uh, I've learned a lot more like, Oh, if they got me, they got me and let me learn how to get out of it. But in the fight, you, you have to be willing to, to take them to deeper waters than they're willing to take you to. And yep. I think that's, that's a principle for life, maybe in business, you know, for, for comp- your competitors, you know, being willing to go where they're not willing to go or, or take them deeper into deeper waters, at least in competition and fighting. And what do you think you said something about superpowers? And I thought that was powerful, but what do you think one of the, you talked about heroes and in, in not afraid, and you kind of simplified it in a, in a profound way that it wasn't about super, uh, powers. So what do you think is kind of a, the traits of a human being and the soul and the heart of a, a man, a woman that puts that kind of hero quality inside of them? Yeah. To me, the number one thing, the testament of somebody's strength, you know, cause we tend to, when we speak hero, we all, especially in like a martial art world, that's very testosterone driven. We got so much of this emphasis on strength and toughness and willpower. And those are great things. But unless those things are at the service of kindness, mm. of vulnerability, mm. of just helping people out, of just trying, to, then I don't care for them. You know, I don't want uh, Hitler to be stronger, more disciplined, and have more willpower. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's not an advantage. It's like, great, you're more effective at being a terrible person. It's like, at the <laughs> end of the day, all those qualities that make you more effective only mean something if they are more effective at something that uh, bring joy to other human beings that bring uh, and i really value tremendously both vulnerability because that shows mm. me you're really strong because otherwise you know you put this facade of strength and you're high you know vulnerability is key and uh, and ultimately kindness because mm. you know we all struggle we all deal with everyone in life is gonna, gonna go through terrible stuff Finding a way to help people along and hoping that they help you along is the, that to me is what, you know, so often we hear stories about people who go through traumatic abuse through no fault of their own, but then they internalize their abuse and they have so much anger, so much stuff, and then they pass it on to somebody else. And then they keep that cycle of abuse going that got passed on from one person mm-hmm. to another to another. To me, heroic is having had your ass kicked by life or having been abused or having something and uh, and making a conscious choice that it stops with you. And what you'll pass out is kindness. What you'll pass out is helping people. That to me is a hero. You know, that to me is I bow and go like, (laughs) that's a human being that I love right there. You know, that's a superpower. I love that. Um, we, We actually have a program called Heroes in Waiting. Uh, within mm-hmm. Fight for the Forgotten, and it's with martial arts academies and in schools. And it's a 12-week program that the instructor on the mats can take them through. And there's 12 weekly, quote-unquote, hero challenges. But mm-hmm. within it, there's two of them that are random acts of kindness. But one's a yeah. secret random act of kindness, like because you don't need the Instagram likes yeah. or the TikTok views or the praise and the pats on the back. You just do it because it's the right thing to do. And how can you do it secretively? And then to journal it and to come back and you have a safe space to share it. Um, but and then hopefully, and I've seen that create kind of this ripple effect within them whenever they get to share what they got to do. Um, it kind of just has this 
building the momentum effect that then others want to do that same thing. And in a bullying scenario, whenever someone stands up, it's what I love is seeing that maybe the psychology in it, but the CDC basically says with, um, they did a, a study on the victims of bullying, the, the, the person who acts as a bully and the number three at risk of suicide was the bully. The number yeah. two at risk was the victim. Well, then I was like, well, when I was reading that, I was like, who's number one? And it was actually the person that is bullied. And then they react by being a bully in return. So they're doing it on both sides. So now they're at, I don't know, they're torn because yep. they don't like how they're being bullied and they don't want to bully somebody else. And so that's the person at the highest risk. So what we've seen with our program is like, man, the person that is the quote unquote innocent bystander, they're actually in reality, a silent supporter because it didn't, it didn't choose them or they didn't choose it. It chose them, but now they're presented with a choice. Am I going to do something or am I going to do nothing? And simply as saying something as small as, Hey, that's not kind that will right. stop bullying in its tracks more than 50% of the time. I think it's closer to eight or nine out of 10 times. Like he'll stop it just by standing up and saying something as simple as that. Hey, that's not kind like doing something about it. And I think Absolutely. I had to learn that through martial arts. Yeah. And if you know the person, like if it's, uh, it's different, if it's kind of, we are in a random situation or if you know the person, then maybe taking them aside when they are not in the moment, not under everybody's size and right. going like, man, you are a cool human being. You're a hundred times better than that. You don't want to do that. Yeah. It's like, is that our truth? Is this who you want to be? You know, is this because that's a choice at the end of the day. It's like, do you want to be the guy who you hated because he's the one holding you? Or do you want to be, in that sense, there's something even like a good use of ego. You know, that if you mm. stimulate somebody's ego with like, look, you have a chance to be something amazing and heroic. Or you can be another asshole who got abused and decide to make everybody else miserable because of it. It doesn't have to be that way. You can be something that I would bow down to and just be off. Please, it would be nice if you could try to be that person, you know? And, uh, and you know, sometimes we need that mental little, like that model, that image of, oh, I, I have that option. There is that archetype out there where I mm -hmm. can embody that. I can choose which one I want. And of course, it's easier said than done, choose, because clearly when there's so much pent up trauma and emotion and anger, a lot of times they run the program and you don't feel that you have a choice. But there is that tiny room of choice that you can slowly increase into it until it doesn't become an automatic response, you know, where it's not like the, where there's a gap between the stimulus that make you mad and upset or angry and your reaction. I, I remember yeah. once my daughter was so funny, man, because like <laughs> sometimes I've never, I mean, on one end, like she tells me, oh, no, you are always fantastic. You are great. You are this. I'm like, eh, to a point. You know, I raised my voice way more than I should have. I lost my cool in ways that I shouldn't have. And, and I remember once when she did, like, she pushed my buttons for, like, hours in a row. And finally, I had it. And she sees me that I'm just turning purple and about. <laughs> and she just stepped in right before I went, like... I was like, what the she, Right before I say anything, she goes, hey, uh, you know, if you want to go to the bathroom and scream, I totally understand. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that made me laugh because at that point, I'm like, as a matter of fact, yeah, that's exactly what I'm feeling. But it's funny that you caught me right at that moment. And it's like, so it was uh, funny because, you know, then you see it and it's like, oh, okay, I get it. I get it. Wow, that's great. That's great. What are some other tools then that, you see that you've been able to use in your personal life or that's great for others to use that maybe that trauma can stop with them. They don't have to perpetuate that cycle and put that onto other people, but it could be a practice or a tool yeah. to be able to handle that and to appropriately respond instead of just have those snap reactions. I think it's important to have uh, rituals hmm. that you can connect with that that part of you that's the more idealistic, that's the best part of you, that's the, the one that embodies all those qualities that you wish you could embody 24-7. 
make a ritual of getting in touch with it. Make a, whether it is um, listening to a certain music or reading some passages or meditating on it or something where you have the mental model of what it means. So that when something pushes your button, in the back of your head, there is still that like, hey, remember, I want to be this person. Uh, is that how this person would react to this? Oh, but this pushed me wrong. I'm me-. like, yes, I get it. You have reasons. But is this who you want to, is that the archetype of the person you want to be? Is that the mm-hmm. hero, so to speak, the hero in your soul? Is that the one that's going to, and have that as a, because we all know it. It's not about knowing it. It's about practicing it, right. you know, and just uh, dusting it off so that it's there when you need it. And so I do feel that, um, and, you know, the ritual can be different from everybody and can change over time because sometimes, you know, watching maybe the same scene over and over start losing its its impact after a while. Sure. So kind so of keep it find- fresh sometimes. Yeah, yeah. You find many examples of that thing that helps you get in touch with the best part of you. And then you rotate through them. And, you know, maybe that means in the morning you take five minutes to think about it. To Okay, I'm, ha- I'm having a day today. Today I'm going to have to do this, this and the other. This is who I want to be today. This mm-hmm. is, uh, this is the, the qualities I want to embody today. This is the person that I want to see in the mirror. And, you know, thinking about it and telling yourself. I like that a lot. And what, what would be maybe a part of your morning ritual or nightly ritual or things that you help cue, cue up who you want to be so that you can actually put it into practice? And sometime I find um, maybe right before bed, going to sleep, like thinking about the next day, thinking about uh, how you're going to get up, how you're going to approach the day. I remember it as, um, I mean, this wasn't nearly as an important issue, but I remember in college, like having to write papers on topic I didn't give a crap about. And, and you know, half of the time you ruin your weekend because you are spending hours dreading doing it and you're not doing crap and you're already just with the mind and in a bed. And and then waste a bunch of times and all of that. And so like my mental meditation about it was like, okay, tomorrow you have the whole day to do it. But when you get up, it's samurai time, you know, is whatever cool movies you've ever watched, whatever that that's what you, now you're applying to some damn paper, but it's not any less meaningful in terms of, uh, is still an ability to step up when you need to rather than whining and complaining and then eventually three hours later starting and still doing it with this attitude i don't really want to it's like we don't give a crap we understand nobody wants to do that you still got to do it step up when you wake up go with a purpose go with an intent go and make it happen and i find it useful i find it uh, recently i got that this is not my there's a pad of a chance that that may be mildly psycho, but I remember I got stuck. I was writing a book these days and I got stuck for like two or three weeks in a row. And I was, uh, you know, you find every excuse. Suddenly your house is the cleanest it's ever been. You know, you find every excuse possible not to do that thing that scares you, challenge you and everything. And it got so frustrating day after day, finding an excuse and then pushing it to the next day and pushing it to the next day to a point where two weeks in, I was like, man, I'm an awful human being. It's like, what's wrong with you? Just step up. And and one day I just, I sat at the computer, I pulled out a knife, I put it on the table and I was like, okay, you got five hours. I'm not asking for the moon here. I just need one sentence. If you don't get one sentence done, please chop off the tip of your pinky by the time it's done. <laughs> and like, now, the thing is, you never actually have to get to that place. Right. But the point is, no, we're taking it seriously. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, you are going to do it. If you just sit there, you are going to do it probably within the first five minutes. But that to me is the mental sign of, there is no not doing it. You know, that's right. not an option. That just is... Uh, I've used this uh, psycho samurai yakuza approach a few times. Like to me, I'm huge about giving my word. Mm. Like there's no chance in hell that I can give you my word and not keep it. Wow. 
I would tell you if I if I'm 99 sure I can keep it. I will tell you. Uh, pretty positive I can pull it off, but I'm not giving you my word because once I give you my word, I want it to be. There's no chance, ifs or buts. There's no excuse because to me, the moment you start fighting justifications is the moment where your word stop meaning anything. Mm. So to me, it's like you break your word, you have a date with ritual disembowelment at that point, because that's <laughs> the only honorable path after that. Right. Well, is and, that something uh, that you you developed uh, into, do you see maybe in your youth and as you've matured that you've upheld your word a whole lot more? Or have you always had that tenacity of, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. Maybe when you were 20, maybe it was a 98% chance, but now it's a hundred, you know, something like that. Yeah, I think is, I mean, of course, practice has, right. but I think I was, I forget what it was, but something I must have seen as a kid or experienced as a kid where I was like, man, this sucks. And I hate not only people who are untrustworthy, but people who are untrustworthy and find excuses for their being crappy to other people. So I hate it so much that I never, ever, ever want to be that person. So here is how I can. It's doable. I just need to be serious about it. I just need to take it like my life depends on it. Mm and treat it as such yeah no like eh, I, I have a good purpose i meant well and oh well it didn't quite well, well there was that one exception it's like no man yep. we are not playing that game i love that because i think a lot of people struggle with i think most human beings are so well-intentioned i mean a lot are well-intentioned and but a lot of times have poor follow-through on yeah. those intentions or their promises and not seeing those through. I mean, that's a challenge to me. Like if I say something I'm going to do, I better do it. And I, I, I feel that like raising the bar of necessity or the stakes higher, uh, because I've had those times where I'll push stuff off to the next day or push stuff off sure. the next day. And maybe sometime I need to stick a steak knife into the table and say, you're going to do this. You're going to get it done. Yeah. And, and yeah. I mean, you need to be realistic. Right? right. If you say I'm going to work out every day of the year, it's like, no, you won't, you know, something's going to happen that you want. So, Give yourself, and also that's a way to develop that willpower, is give yourself real small, realistic goals. Mm. Feel good about the fact that you said, uh, before the end of the day, I'm going to do one set of push-ups. Okay, it's not the end of the world. You've got to take it 30 seconds, right? So if you mean it, you can do it. It's mm. like the, there's no way to fail kind of thing. So almost giving yourself challenges that are almost fail-proof, all you got to do is step up. It's not even about how well you perform or anything. And make a habit of when you say it, you follow through. Tiny yeah. goals, right? Really small goals. Because if it's too daunting, then you're scared of failing and you won't do it. Or maybe you will fail and then you feel crappy about yourself. Uh-uh. Tiny, tiny, doable goals that, however, build the habit of saying something and you did it. Right. Oh, and I did it again. I said I would and I did eventually you start believing yourself. You start believing that you actually, when you say it, you mean it and it's going to happen. And it's not even like, it doesn't even go through your mind that you wouldn't kind of thing. And each time you take it damn seriously. Um, Mellow goals, but take it really seriously. Yeah, I think that's a really powerful point because I think, so my last guest on the show was Rafael Lovato Jr., the MMA fighter. And he was my coach in MMA and he's one of the most accomplished men to ever do the sport of jujitsu. And he's just always about consistency and showing up and getting that 1% better, that 0.01% better. And that's a win. And I think for maybe a lot of people, they, they compare themselves. And I think comparison's the thief of joy and that we always compare up around everyone else. But someone could look at you and think, wow, he's written these books. He has this podcast. He's done all this stuff. And how do you break those specific things down? I mean, how many book have you, books have you written now? I know at least three or four. 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 And so four books, you've got two incredibly successful podcasts with mm-hmm. History on Fire and the Duncan, uh, Drunken Taoist. And to, that's a lot of prep work um, mm-hmm. for those shows. How do you break that down to get ready for whether you're writing a book and getting that published or publishing just a single episode that takes a lot of work? Yeah, I mean, that's just... It's funny because on one end, I feel like I think there are those two 
elements that you need to be effective at anything, which on one end, you can't be too satisfied. You need to want to keep pushing and hustle and work hard. And on the other hand, you need to pat yourself on the back and mm. acknowledge, hey, job, good job, job well done. Because otherwise, your yard is just driven machine who's just whipping yourself along the way. That's not the point. So it's important to have some appreciation for yourself and patting yourself on the back while at the same time, I mean, when I think about the stuff I've done, I'm like, yeah, that's sweet. But anything short of um, single-handedly making the world a better place and erasing suffering for humanity, you're a damn failure because that's the goal. All the (laughs) other stuff is just, yeah, okay, nice, whatever, you know, it's like... And those two live together. You know, one end, I feel that nothing I ever do will be good enough to my standards. And at the same time, I do have a lot of self-love where I go like, man, you're doing your best. You're doing good stuff. You're good. Uh, Okay, now do some more. (laughs) And and I think it's important because people who are driven often are so driven, but very negative to Mm. themselves, like very harsh. Their own worst critic. Yes. And people who are coddling themselves, they do it too much where that is like, well, that's nice, but can you also get your ass off the couch and do something once in a while? You know, it's like, and I think both are extremely important. And, um, and a lot of it is just, you know, making good use of time, just staying focused, waking up, having a plan, giving yourself, oh, making a good use of time is a tricky one too, because sometimes the stuff that we think would work doesn't. Sometimes I spend 12 hours working and, uh, and I don't get as much as I do on a day. Like I went to, I went with my daughter and my lady, we went to Hawaii late, lately and we spent a week and it was such a blast. We were just mm. on the beach hanging out and enjoying every moment of the day. And I tell you, in those days where I work probably maybe two hours a day, I got more done than most 12 hour days at home. And so I was like, oh, okay. So it's not just flagellate myself and tell myself to work harder. Sometimes work less and uh, mm-hmm. just put time in something that fits me, that it makes me feel happy, that inspire me. I then, when I get to work, I'm so on that it pays off. And then you experiment, right? You try. It's like, okay, I've been slacking a little. I've been doing the let's have fun part a little too much. Let's switch to the more discipline, get to work, work hard from this time to this time, and that's it. Other days you need to... So it's constantly you got to switch it around to figure out what's working at any one particular time. But yeah, I think a lot of it boils down to those very unsexy words like discipline and willpower and those things that are... Yeah, there's no getting around those. Yeah, I think that's a powerful point that you need you need balance in all of them. You you need to structure and ritual and discipline. But there was I'm going to slaughter who said it, but there was a quote in one of my daily planners, and it was either someone like Michelangelo or Einstein said some of the greatest geniuses get the most done when they work less. And it was, yeah. it was basically on a Saturday or Sunday and it was kind of the weekend ritual page in my planner that was like saying, Hey, take it easy, take it easy and, 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 and recharge yeah. and you're going to get some more stuff done. And for yeah. you to bring up that point, it's beautiful. Yeah. It, it, it's surprising because we think more is better that way. And it's not sometimes and in that sense, you know, if you, let's say you, you have people working for you, I think that's a, you know, we think that the best way is to just make them work hard mm-hmm. and drive them and push them. To me, sometimes the opposite can be true. It's like, dude, I don't care. Spend time with your family, go to the beach, do whatever you want. I just need this done by the end of the month. If you can get it done, I don't care if you take, if you manage to do it in an hour a day, as long as the quality is good and the result is good, it's all I care about. Right. So then people, rather than spending eight hours at the office, resenting it at every step of the way and thinking, you know, really giving you two hours of work and spending six hours on Facebook, then they are like, because they want to enjoy that time for the stuff they want to do, when they work, they really work and they are on and they are, hey, if I get this done within a week, I have three weeks off. Mm. Let's go. Let's make it happen. You know, you help people in a way give themselves motivation rather than being the slave master with the whip kind of thing. 
Yeah, I love that. It's almost the principle of work smarter, not harder, because there's sometimes on the mats, you beat your body down so much. And there's been something from the wrestling world that has started to shift in the MMA world where it used to be get on the mat, stay there longer, push harder, grind, 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 beat each other up, and then you'll be ready for battle. And some of that works. But then if you don't ever get there because of injuries, or if you don't ever right. get there and, and, and you've basically overtrained and you're yep. conditioning, it's crazy when you're in a state of overtraining and your body's not repairing, that you can have worked harder than you ever, ever have worked in your life. And you can still have that week for that peak week. And then you get in the cage and it feels like your conditioning's not there. Your, your movement's more slow. Your muscle memory isn't, you're not firing on all cylinders. And it's because you've overworked yourself from the stress and the fear that I have to perform to where then yep. you actually cripple your performance. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, when you think about it, I think we all had that experience where you work, you work, you work, and you're not getting better. And then you take time off for a week or two and you get back and you're way better. And you're like, wait, what? Yeah. I just stopped training. How is How did that happen? <laughs> it's like your mind is fresher. You're more excited. You're more driven. Your body's rested. And suddenly you perform way better. And you're like, huh? Okay, yeah. I did not see that coming. Or even the way the Thai fight, right? Like hmm. the Thai guys, they can't afford to get injured because yeah. they, if they injure, their family starves. So yep. they need to be, they don't spar hard. They do hard conditioning. They do hard pad work. They got that stuff going on. But when it comes to sparring, it's purely technical sparring. It's yep. just touch, touch, touch. There's no hard contact because if anybody gets injured, they don't fight. If they don't fight, they are screwed. So can't afford to do that. Yeah. And that they get in the ring and they are absolute beasts, you know? Absolute beast. Some of the best in the world. I mean, just yeah. incredible culture too. Fightfortheforgotten.org. You can go check out Fight for the Forgotten, the foundation that I started. It is my passion project. It is something that I love so much because of the people we get to help. We get to help the pygmy tribe who adopted me in help themselves. We say opportunity is greater than charity. Charity can be great, but opportunity is just always better. That's why we've drilled something like 80 water wells already, providing over 30,000 people clean water. We've started sustainable farms, bought back over 3,000 acres of land for the people who originally owned it, put it in their name. We built 32 homes, and now we're about to start a health center, a school, and a marketplace. They're gonna have a maternity ward, a pediatrics unit, and a dental suite. You can join the Fight for the Forgotten Fight Club at fightfortheforgotten.org. We would love, love, love to invite you on this journey to join this fight arm in arm with us. Our fight club, it's a monthly giving club. You can give $5 or more a month, and that empowers us to empower people. Thank you for being on this journey with us. I invite you to come along for the ride. It's been absolutely epic, putting love and compassion in action and fighting for people. Fightfortheforgotten.org. Join our fight club. Speaking of culture and your mind firing and getting excited, you have two podcasts. And mm -hmm. can you share like what drove you to start each one of them? And which one are you most excited about? Sure. So the way it started was uh, back in 2011. I had no idea what podcasts even were. And I had written a book and I got uh, Matt Staggs who hooked us up, yes. actually. Who, who linked Matt, us up together. He's a great man. Uh, yeah, he, he was fantastic, man. He helped me out so much. And uh, he uh, hooked me up, like my first two podcast experience were the deepest possible end of the pool. They were Adam Carolla and Joe Rogan. <laughs> And so keep in mind, at that time, my life is falling apart is every conceivable way. So when Matt told me, I'm like, great, who cares? You know, I was like, sure, I'll go do it, but whatever. You know, I like, I had zero, I have like so much other stuff to worry about that I wasn't really all that. I mean, in some way it was good because I wasn't self-conscious about it at all or intimidated by the numbers. I was just like, ah, whatever. So but I went there and then, uh, you know, things particularly with Rogan went really well and uh, people liked it. And so he had me on again and then other people started having me on as a guest. And I started hearing over and over, the, hey, you need to start your own podcast. And I was like, 
man, I'm already working so hard. I'm already doing too many things. Yeah, just what I did. So at one point, just to get people off my back, like I was on Facebook and I was like, sure, I'll do it. If somebody, if I don't have to learn anything about editing, recording, putting it on uh, putting it online, any of that, sure. I was hoping that that would shut people up and would leave me alone. And instead, like um, a guy named Rich Evers was on Facebook at that moment. He was like, I'm a film editor in Culver City. I can record it and edit it for you. And then uh, somebody else, <laughs> that Evan Culver, stepped up. and was like, I'll take care of the website. And I was like, shit, I just <laughs> bluffed it and they called my bluff. That's no... <laughs> So eventually I decided, you know, the Drunken Taoist had more of a Rogan model, was more like it's a chatty podcast about anything that I feel like talking about. You know, I tend to view a lot of life through the lenses of Taoism, but it's not in a strictly philosophical sense. He was, you know, one day you talk about pretty much any topic known to man, you know, it's like doesn't even... And I like the freedom that that gives me. I like the fact that I can talk to anybody I want. Sometimes it's interviews. Sometimes it's just me and Rich Evers chatting. And uh, I love that factor. I really dig that. Eventually, after a while, I realized uh, I teach history for a living. I am podcasting. Uh, One of my all-time favorite podcasts is Hardcore History by Dan Carlin. Maybe we could put two and two together and then the logical conclusion is that you should do a history podcast. And uh, of course, from thinking it to doing it was a long way, not even because I was lazy about it, but because the amount of preparation that goes into a history podcast is insane. Mm. You know, chatty podcast, I can research a little, not that much and hop on and free flow and it's fun. History, you need to become an instant expert on a topic that you may or may not know something about. So you may have to spend six weeks reading 10 books on that topic until you know it up and down, back and forth in every which way. And so that one is brutal in terms of time investment. It's also a lot of fun because essentially you create a movie in a way, like you get to tell this, you know, you take all the, most of the books I end up reading are not fun to read. They are great sources of information, but they are not exactly entertaining. But you get to dig for gold there. You find this little episode, this story, this thing that then stimulates your ideas about you can put them together. By the time you put them together, it's like you're directing a cool movie that's based on history it's all true but then it's you add the fun to it and it becomes something so that one is um i think that one is considerably more successful and i think it's because uh, people have a label that they can attach to it that's more easily recognizable so it's like oh i wanna i wanna check out history oh these look like a good podcast whereas drunk and tau is there is no label there is no i want to check out what life you know it's, it's a little <laughs> too uh, vague in that sense so i love the freedom it gives me but it's also more problematic in ter- that's why you know in any bookstore they have the heading of where you go to look the books about this topic or that topic or uh, people listen to somebody because they connect them to one idea right and then they expect them to be that all the time there are advantages and disadvantages, right? On one end, you have a ready-made audience. On the other end, you end up kind of in a cage in terms of what your stick is, and you can really deviate from that. So, um, the only good thing in that regard is that history gives me the freedom to do essentially any history. Mm-hmm. So I can uh, pick radically different topics, uh, inject any idea I'm interested in. I'll find some example in history that fits. So I can still have some freedom, but it's definitely very history based. That's you can't depart from that. Yeah, I don't. I mean, a side note is I don't think you could have a better voice for a history podcast than your own. I mean, I think uh, people are just going to love hearing you talking about any part of history at all, any any anything from the past. And what was the first driver for you to take interest in history? And um, what's some of the most you've learned about life through history? Yeah, when I was a kid, uh, you know, I grew up, I was born in 1974. So I grew up in uh, Italy at a time when there were maybe two TV channels. And, uh, you know, you got kids programs are half hour a day type of stuff. So 
you know, no internet, limited TV. There wasn't a whole, and I was an only child, so there was a lot of time alone to be bored. So I I'm got the only into, child, so I understand. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so I got into books as um, there were books that were written for kids, but they were really well done. They weren't like kind of like low level, like they were still well explained, well written, but they had a lot of uh, images where they would draw uh, the past. They would draw like, you know, if you are in ancient Egypt and it would be a whole thing about, you see these different scenes, you have this clip on the side and break down what you are looking at, or this is the marketplace in Egypt. And it looks like almost a Where's Waldo scene where so much is happening. And so I would spend hours just looking at it and imagine running a movie in my head essentially imagining that guy in the corner right there who's running away from this dude because he stole from his store and then got busted by the pharaoh guard and then there's and you know i'm just running movies in my head and it was fun and so i wanted to learn more because he would give me more material for my mental movies and yeah it would be entertaining you know and then uh and then you can play with your toy soldiers that way. And then you, so to me, it was like, he was play. He was something that I picked up as a very young kid, as a form of play and entertainment. And so eventually then I was like, well, yeah, of course, it is play and entertainment. If it's not fun, what's the point? And, uh, and then the other side that you brought up is what you learn from it. Mm. I felt that anything that has ever happened in history, Anything that is any good idea that I'm attracted to happen historically. So it's like history is like a lab that allow you to experiment with ideas and concepts and priorities that other people have gone through that you don't have personal experience of. Because, you know, we can only have so much personal experience of stuff. History gives you a window of what it means to be human on a, on a wider scale. And so I love, I mean, you know, I, particularly love biographies where you get to see history through a person's eyes because you know if you're talking about you know big forces out there i mean that's important to understand what's happening but it gets so much more interesting when you can look it through the eyes of a person that you mm. can relate to you can see their values you can see their fuck ups you can see where they do something great where they do and you learn about life that way, right? You learn about life in, through that process. And uh, that's one of the things I love the most. Yeah. Is there any historical figure or person that you've been able to look through their eyes and have learned the most or get most excited about their story and what they've taught? Yeah. One of the, you know, so many of the stories I like tend to be people who are mildly mentally deranged okay. there's a lot of like uh sort of the punisher tv series vibes in the character i okay. like whether yeah. it's crazy horse or whether it's still the roosevelt or whether it is you know it's like somewhat lovable but man they got issues uh so for a change i really like one of my all-time favorites is uh this guy named eq EQ was a Zen monk from the 1400s, and he did have a rough life. You know, he's, uh, he was this illegitimate child of the emperor of Japan, so no contact with his father. His mom had to put him in a monastery when he was only five years old to wow. kind of prove, like, look, he's not going to be a challenge to the title of emperor. He's going to just be a monk. And so he grows up basically without his parents in a fairly harsh, joyless environment. He does go through some struggle. There's at one point he attempts suicide. But mm. eventually, there's something that is able to learn in his life where the, the man that comes out through the other end is just the most fun guy you can imagine. His priorities were uh, Zen, women, and drinking. He was okay. a big fan of all three. <laughs> and he just loved life right he was just a guy who and what i love about it is that many times you tend to break the rules many of the guys who break the rules they break them in a very self-serving kind of way where it's like i want what's good for me and in right. the process i screw everybody else over everybody like all the testimonies about it is that people who came in contact with him loved the guy they he was just this but he was unashamedly happy to enjoy his life and go for it even in the harshest circumstances even in you know, he has this one line that's one of my all-time favorite lines that says, uh, throw me into hell and I'll find a way to enjoy it. And wow. I'm like, 
man, that's a powerful one, right? Because he's not denying that bad stuff can happen and will happen. And there's not much you can do about that. But he's like, you know what? I'm going to find a way to enjoy it anyway. And that to me is the ultimate uh, middle finger to a harsh universe. Yeah. Is, uh, <laughs> so I love it. That guy, and he's funny, man. You read his stories and you're like on the floor laughing because he's such a joker and uh, just just an awesome guy. Can you share his name one more time? Because I'm going to go look him up and check some things sure. out. Sure. EQ is I-K-K-Y-U. Okay. And uh, so if you put the Zen, uh, Zen monk, EQ something. Have you specifically done a podcast about him? Yeah, yeah. I've done a couple of them. Those ones are freely available everywhere and stuff. Yeah, there's uh, one. It was called uh, Sex, Asaki, and Zen. (laughs) I forgot the second one. But yeah, it's it's such a good story. He sounds like an interesting character. And also the history can be so heavy some of the time. There are so many stories that are depressing and horrible and bloody and this and that. So it's nice for a change to run into something that's just a good, happy story. It just inspires you, not in a cautionary tale, but in a in a positive way. Right. That's powerful. I love that, that you could, uh, I mean, being thrown into hell and finding a way to enjoy it. I mean, that's a, that's a powerful perspective. Not saying yeah. that like all of it will be fun, but no. I'm going to find fun there. And, and it's, you know, there's a defiance there. It's like, mm-hmm. it's not that uh, I choose that or I want that or it's not going to suck horrendously, but it's basically a way to say, okay, you haven't crashed me yet. I'm still here. And as long as I'm still here, I will find some enjoyment. So the day when I stop doing that is because you have crashed me completely. And it's yeah. Not- if, if, and, if there's still breath in my lungs and a beating heart in my chest and a, a yep. working mind in my brain, like I'm going to, I'm going to find a way to smile and laugh almost yeah, pointing back uh, to, even if there's, there's no hope I'm going to yeah, find. I have a line in fact that I've used, uh, I've used even as a chapter in the not afraid that say answering hopelessness with a defiant smile and raised middle finger. Yes, because that's the vibe, right? It's like it's uh, it's not saying it doesn't hurt. It's not saying it cannot be terrible. But it's like, look, if I'm still standing, screw you. I'm still gonna enjoy it. I'm yes. still gonna find a way to go for it. You know. I love that. I love that. Thank you for sharing his story, your story, and then I was wondering, do you have you done much into Stoic philosophy? I've been getting into that quite a bit. Yeah. Is there so a figure the that you like, and wh- what's your perspective on that? I mean, the principles are great. Right, Stoic principles are fantastic. Um, some of the Stoic guys take it in a direction where it gets a little—I don't know what. The, I want to be fair to it, but like it sounds so dry and just joyless. Like I was reading, I, I did a couple of episodes about Marcus Aurelius, and I was all excited because you know I talked to Ryan Holiday, and he said, "Oh, it's fantastic!" And you know, some of the ideas are fantastic. Don't get me wrong; Ryan is right about that. But when I look at Marcus Aurelius and his life, I was like, "Man, this is a joyless bastard." It's like it's all. There's no point to it all. It's all meaningless and hopeless, but you should do your duty and step up and do. And I'm like, yeah, I get that. I, that appeals to me to some level, but I also want a little spice to it, a little more, you know, where at one point he, he described sex as like, I forget the exact wording, but it was like the expulsion of mucus. And, and I was like, Jesus <laughs> Christ, no wonder your wife is cheating with you or you with everybody else. It's like, What's your problem? And and that's some kind of the vibe I got with the Stoics was great principles, sometimes taken a little too far. Yeah. Sometimes it's like, okay, put some mellow out your Stoicism just by a couple of inches and we are good. And that, that's a sweet spot. Yeah. I, I loved how you started Not Afraid and that you said... I mean, it was an interesting perspective because for me, I'm someone, you know, the Coliseum, that's where the gladiators are. MMA fighters are kind of like the modern day gladiator, mm-hmm. gladiators of sorts. And that's a place that I've always wanted to visit. And in the book, you shared how you had come over here. I forget if you're 18 or 24 years old, 18. 18, 18. Yeah. And, and in that you just couldn't see yourself living in Italy. And I, that was that was interesting perspective because you said it is a place everyone that's great to go visit, but how, how would you set that up in a way that's appropriate and honors 
Hunter is the way you um, said it. I think like, I mean, for one, of course, when you live in one place, you take stuff for granted and you think that the good stuff is everywhere and that the bad stuff is only there. And then you go somewhere else and you go like, oh, the good stuff was not for granted. I see it now. So, of course, you appreciate it more. Sure. But also, I think the vibe was that uh, in Italy, part of the culture was very conservative. And I don't mean politically conservative. I mean conservative in terms of uh, accepting new ideas and novelty. You would run, you know, you come up with a new idea, you are going to run into 10 really smart people who give you really smart reasons why it can't be done. Mm. And uh, in US, I would run into sometimes people who for completely naive and dumb reasons would say yes. And I'm just like, you know what? I take stupid optimism over cynical, uh, smart, any day. You know, it's like, at least in one case, there's movement. There's chance to make stuff happen. In the other case, you're giving me a whole beautiful dissertation for why nothing can change. I don't want to hear that. I right. want to I want to try things. I want to make things happen. And so... You know, in American culture, there's a lot more of that willingness to try stuff, which I appreciate. Um, Sometimes even stuff that shouldn't be tried, but at least there's a, there's movement, there's life, you know. Right. There's a, so I do I do really appreciate that about living in the U.S. I mean, there's no way I could have done the stuff I've done in Italy. Like, I give you an example. I started teaching college when I was 27. In Italy, the average age of a college professor is 60 and up. Wow. Um, so, you know, there are some structural things that would just not happen in Italy, you know, and, uh, and so I really, now, having said that, there's a lot that I appreciate, you know, mm-hmm. I thought Italy wasn't sociable and friendly enough, and I came to US, and I was like, whoa, okay, uh, I guess Italy has a win on that side, because it was <laughs> so much more social and tribal and all that. So it's, uh, you know, anywhere you go, there are plus and minuses. There's definitely stuff I love about Italy, but I also completely understand why I felt that for what I wanted to do being in US was uh, was a better shot. Yeah. And I wonder if we could shift gears real quick to fatherhood, because I wonder about, yeah, the the maybe the rigidness or the structure of Italy. And to be a professor, you need to be in your 60s or above. Yeah. And what are the things that you've learned from your daughter or from being a father? I think sometimes, you know, stepping in and seeing a 12 year old and 16 year old and seeing how creative they are. One's like, uh, one, one loves to play music and and I'm not musically inclined and she can play the guitar and the bass and she can sing on stage and play the piano. And the other is a, like kind of a gymnast and she's twisting and bending and cartwheeling and backhand springs. And I'm just like, wow, there's like a zest for life. Absolutely. And it's interesting sometimes where you can see a clear connection with what you fed them and where you don't, you know, like, uh, for example, she, she's really good at writing, expressing herself verbally, you know, back when she was 11, uh, last year, they did some tests uh, trying to fit what grade she should be in. And they were like, yeah, kind of out of the range. You would be in college to which she promptly commented, Hey, I read your students' papers. I hope they are not comparing me to those poor bastards because I hope I'm better than that. And I was like, I, I can see you need to work on your self-esteem. Yes, that's uh, lacking. And But then you see other stuff where it's like, that just are. Like, uh, it's funny you mentioned music because, yeah, I'm, I love music, but I suck at it. I can't do anything with it. And she's a killer singer. Like, since she was a baby, she had this crazy pitch perfect voice and not just the technicality of it, but the emotion. Mm. Like, she's able to put emotion in stuff. In um, I was talking with um, this guy, Ulysses Bella. He's from the band Ozomatli. Great musician. Great jiu-jitsu guy, by the way, too. He's a black belt in jiu-jitsu. And I was asking you, hey, what, what's with her voice? What do you think? Because, I mean, she sing really well, but I've heard other kids sing really well, but they don't get quite the same response that she gets. And he was like, well, some people can sing the blues, and then there are people who can sing the blues. And mm-hmm. I was like, oh, I get it. I get it. Okay. So, yeah, there is that emotional, that ability to put emotion into it that people, that touches something in people rather than going like, oh, that's a cool voice. Nice. You know? And I love that because that's all her. Right. Mm-hmm. I have nothing to do with it whatsoever. It's all her own talent, her own development. I can't really help in any way. 
And it's cool to see that where it's like some stuff is yours and you have helped and you push them and you help develop it. And other things are like, you are a different person. You are not just a mini me clone kind of thing. It's you are your own person and it's awesome. Wow. That's great. I love that. I'm just uh, really, really grateful for you being here, sharing all this wisdom. Thank you for, yeah, sharing your wisdom, your knowledge, your heart with us and being vulnerable. I think that's at the end of the day, that's what it's all about, right? It's like, it's all about emotions. It's all about uh, whether it's good music, good movies, good people, stuff that inspire us, history, all of it is, if there's good emotional content, then it speaks to us. It means something. Otherwise, we're just wasting our time. <laughs> What's yeah. the point? It's like, okay, yeah, we learned something. Who cares? How does that relate to anything in life, you know? Yeah, well, so, so with, with this podcast is called Overcome. And yeah. one of the things I like to say is that we've overcome 100% of our darkest days. Mm-hmm. Is there anything that you are personally or professionally in process of overcoming right now? Uh, I would say, yeah, many things. Uh, I think like couple that stand out from um, what I want to do in life. Like I've always more than anything else. I've wanted to write fiction Mm. and I've never done it. And I'm 48 years old and I'm like, man, get on with it. So that's what I'm trying to do. I'm writing a historical fiction about the life of Caravaggio, the painter, who was a straight up gangster, has a crazy backstory, has really wild, like both. And turns out I have a lot to say about me, that Italian gangster with PTSD. So this thing is, <laughs> it looks really like I got maybe 30,000 words in and I'm barely getting started. I'm like, okay, this is probably two books. So, uh, so that I badly want to make it happen. Right. And, you know, sometimes it's scary because it, I care more about it. So I try not to do it because there's fear of failure mm. sometimes. Uh, so that I really want to make that a priority. Uh, on a personal level, I think uh, it's the same thing that we all go through more. Like I want to, I want my bad days to be less, uh, less a letdown compared to my ideals of how I want to be. So I think I've, uh, over the past years, I've improved for sure. I'm uh, way less prone to anger. I'm like way less prone to lash out that way. I'm way, but still there's plenty of room for improvement in that department. So it's like, um, and I think that's a never ending process. So I'm, I'm happy with how far I've come, but I can also see a long way ahead. So it's like, that's where it's at. Yeah. Well, that's so great. I, uh, I'll probably send you something after this, Amy, um, who I love. She, she just let a tweet out not too long ago and it was pretty powerful about how, um, there's an age difference between us and, uh, but she has, um, she looks younger than I, I, I do, but she's, she's older than I am. And she, a lot of people ask her, how did you do this? How did you do this? I mean, you're 48, you're one year younger than she is. And she's released five albums and wrote two books and has a podcast and has done some incredible cool. stuff, but it was yeah. all kind of after 40, right? Um, that was, she picked up a guitar and all of that. And so it was just like in that season of life. So I can't wait to get my hands on the book of, uh, your fiction book. And it's going to be incredible, uh, whenever it does come out. And so that's awesome. I'm, I'm so grateful for your time down here. And when you do get to Austin, I would love to get into the on it ATX gym here. I've seen you frequent there or seen some post and, uh, you love Aubrey. I love Aubrey. And he's actually who brought, uh, Amy and I together. It was because he, he he had an event we were both at and we met each other because of Aubrey. So when you get down here to Austin, I'd love to host you. We'll get an ice bath or sauna or get a workout in. And I'd love to have you on the show again sometime. I mean, I know that's a big ask, but, uh, no, I'd no, love to no, have it's you so in here. fun to chat with you. I really enjoy chatting with you. So it's, uh, and I, I mean, I think, I don't know, probably we are on recording when I said that, but yeah, I remember like hearing you speak, hearing your story, hearing podcasting, which you are a guest and thinking, man, that's an awesome human being, somebody I would love to meet at some point. So oh. I'm very, very happy to have had this occasion when uh, Matt Stagg sent me an email say, hey, do you know Justin Red? I'm like, yeah, I love that guy. I would love to. <laughs> 
chat with you. So wow, well that's. That's such an encouragement to me. Um, Matt was happy to link us up and I was so grateful that it was you, the first guy that he was like, I want to help get you someone on the show. And it being you, I was just like, yes, like I was so stoked and uh, it pumped me up, fired me up because the human being you are. How can people find you best uh, to, to, to follow your podcast, to get your books? So I got, if you can uh, manage the hard was task of figuring out how many L's are in my last name <laughs> and uh, be able to spell it out because uh, uh, complicated Italian names with lots of L's. It's uh, spelled B-O-L-E-L-L-I. And then the gods of Google are good in that regard. And then, you know, I'm gods God, of Google, books, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> you can find all the books. Uh, you can, uh, yeah, the podcast are History on Fire and the Drunken Taoist. Uh, um, what else is out there? Yeah, those are the main things. Sure, we'll we'll be including it uh, all in the show notes and pointing people your way. Uh, but again, thank you so much for you this time. I'm really grateful you. for you. Uh, I can see and hear that you are a true martial artist at heart, and you just exemplify that and exude it in the way that you live your life and share your story and even find the nuggets of gold in history or like people's story from, from history. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here with us today. And I can't wait to, to meet you in person. Thank you, Justin. That's awesome. I look forward to it too. Awesome. Thank you. Amy. Justin. Hi. Hi. In this outro, you're here. I am. You were here, here listening the whole time, right beside me. I was. Daniele Bolelli. I was. It was a beautiful interview. I really enjoyed him. I am, you know, I'm a philosopher at heart. So it was like speaking my language yeah, well, in a you're lot of ways. Trained philosopher. Is am I? Well, don't you have a major or something? I do have a degree in a it. A degree so I suppose, in philosophy. Yeah. I even won the uh, like the uh philosophia award, the oh. philosophy award at my college when I graduated. Wow, look at you. She's hot <laughs> stuff. She's smart stuff. She's got it all. And man, what an incredible episode. He's a badass. And he's an Total awesome badass. human and what a, what a great person. One of my favorite things was when you said that it really shows that he has studied martial arts. Yeah. I agree. Like when you have people who have studied martial arts on, I learned so much and they just are true masters of like their humanity, their emotions, yeah. you know, like really paying attention to life and being, it's so funny because they're masters, but they're actually students. Yeah. So well, of life. you can't be a master unless you are a student first I, and a lifelong student. And he is a master of the calm within the storm and being able to overcome fear, overcome adversity, overcome challenges and face that fear daily and know that he can just start to minimize it. Just even if it's just 0.01% that day compared to the day before, that yeah. is progress. One thing that I think is interesting too, we didn't ask him this and I kind of wish we had, but his book is called Not Afraid, Not Unafraid, you right. know, like, and I think that's kind of an interesting distinction and I'm sure he had a reason behind it, but you know, he, it's, it's almost like unafraid doesn't acknowledge it, but not afraid acknowledges that the fear is there, yeah. but says, I'm not doing like, that's, that's, that's what I'm not choosing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. It's a great point. We also have some fun we're doing. Do we ever? Yeah. We're going to do our first giveaway. Yes. I'm excited. We're going to be doing four gift cards yes. per week, mm -hmm. basically per episode. Yep. If people go leave us a review, because that's how we're going to grow, but also how we're going to get better, how we get to hear the actual voices of our listeners. Yes. And we will be looking at reviews everywhere too, yep. but we are mainly focusing on Apple podcasts right now. So if you could leave us a rating and review on Apple podcasts, it really is quick. It's so quick. And then you can get $25 gift cards to either Amazon or on it. Yeah, absolutely. You can take care of your brain or get something sent to your home. And uh, from Amazon, that's always uh, helpful. And then on it, it's going to help your brain, your body, your soul. Because it's a good, it's a good opportunity if you haven't used any of the Onnit products to get introduced to them. Cause yeah. I hadn't used any, well, maybe, maybe I'd used an alpha brain before I met you, but now yeah. like there's such a part of, I'm wearing, I'm repping the t-shirt today, yeah. but yeah, now there's such a part of my life. So yeah. it's a Total great, human, like great intro. Shroom tech immune, mm -hmm. new mood. You can check these out and see that they actually work just by leaving a review. And then I'm you're going to get a $25 just, gift card. I'm just card. excited to give stuff away. Me too. It uh, feels it's good. a thank you. 
Mm-hmm. It's a true thank you because we are so thankful for our listeners that are here on the show. Yeah. Really, this is why we do it because we want this to be so meaningful to this world, but we do that by making it meaningful to you. So thank you for being here. We're so incredibly grateful uh, to have you on this journey with us to make an impact. Thank you for helping fight for the forgotten. Thank you for helping the show. Thank you for supporting our sponsors. But most of all, truly, and I mean this, thank you for supporting yourself. When you show up, whenever you do the daily practices, whenever you choose to overcome, I mean, that is what life is all about because life is a fight. And this podcast is meant to give you that game plan for victory in this life called fight or in this fight called life. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. Well, thank you guys so much for being here. I appreciate it. Thank you for even being here when I fumble, whenever I mess up. You know what? Actually, that's a perfect example. Like we all make mistakes. Yeah. We're not perfect. And you know what? So what? Yeah. You know what? what? Fun fact is I grew up with a speech therapist from kindergarten to sixth grade. If you didn't know that, I, uh, speech, I mean, I really meant to ask Daniele Bolelli, which we'll be doing that next time. He talks about the fear in his book and not afraid of public speaking. And he compares that to the fear of going into a fight, you know, and, and for me, a really unique thing is I'm not afraid to go fight, but I am afraid to get up on stage and speak. I'm even afraid to sit down in this chair and get ready for a podcast, which is weird, right? I can fight in front of millions. You can talk to me all the time. I can talk to you all the time, (laughs) but sitting down cameras on, that's whenever I get a little nervous. Well, it would be interesting for you to share your story about that with people too, because I don't think a lot of people know your full story of how you started speaking. You were turning down offers, Mm -hmm. how it came your way and that you had had a stutter when you were younger. And yeah. And you even saw that uh, come back out, or at least you didn't notice it, but it was coming back up the other day when I was tired and just uh, had a long meeting. And I noticed it two or three times come up. And afterwards I asked you, did you see that? Did you hear that? Well, you were feeling insecure in that moment too, which is important to, you know, just acknowledge. Like you were having a moment where you were like, am I handling this right? And you were a little nervous about it. And, um, I didn't realize that you were having that that night before. Yeah. And, uh, I needed you to tell me, Hey, this is going on for me. And I, I didn't, I didn't realize until afterwards. So you know, cause we see people as strong and mm. we see people as invincible. And I think a lot of people look at you that way, but everybody has these moments when you're not and you have to acknowledge it and you had that come back up and that's perfectly fine. Yeah. And if people have put, have at all put me on a pedestal, please kick me off of it because I'm just, <laughs> okay, a, I'm just a dude that is uh, <laughs> trying his best, but doesn't get it right a lot. So yeah. Anyways, thank you so much for being part of the show. We love you. We're grateful for you. Thank you for rating, reviewing, subscribing, and we want you to enter because we want you to be able to take care of yourself just a little bit better, whether that's with an Onnit gift card or an Amazon gift card and get something fun for yourself or something that you need. We need to hear from you. Thank you for being part of the show. Thank you for helping us grow. We love you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, don't forget to send your overcome stories to overcomepodcast at gmail.com. And also rate, review, subscribe, and follow Overcome with Justin Wren.